Okay, so it looks like we have a lot of people here. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name is Yara Shafani and I'm the Executive Director of Canadian Friends of Sipio. And I'll be moderating today's panel on occupation and COVID-19. Uh, joining me today as a co-host is Rula Aude, who is a member of the Canadian Friends of Sibyl Board of Directors. So I'll just give a little bit of information about CFAS, Canadian Friends of Sibyl, and who we are. So Canadian Friends of Sibyl is the registered charity focused on raising awareness of the plight of the Palestinian people amongst Canadians, and particularly Christians in Canada. We do this through a variety of educational programs and solidarity initiatives, where we focus on centering the Palestinian narrative, which is often deliberately silenced by broader Canadian media. A great deal of our work is focused on programs within Canadian churches as we try to address uh, Christian Zionism, an ideology that wrongly uses the Christian faith as a way to support injustice, oppression, and occupation. If you'd like to learn more about our work uh, or sign up to our mailing list and learn how to support us, I will be attaching our website link into the chat box. So I want to begin by really thanking you all for joining us today amidst the current reality. I saw a quote the other day that read, crisis doesn't create character, it reveals it. Now, I don't think that the intention of that quote was to be political, but um, my mind just took it there anyways. The pandemic that we are in has revealed and reasserted the structural flaws in our society. We see here in Canada the ways in which those most impacted by COVID-19 represent the most oppressed elements of our society the homeless, the working classes, the underpaid essential workers in the workforce who are predominantly racialized and women, and the indigenous people who are living in remote communities and don't have significant access to healthcare. In Canada, like in other places, COVID-19 has really ripped the bandaid off, so to speak, and reinforced the power structures in our society. In Palestine, as we will hear today, COVID-19 is reinforcing the power structures of occupation and colonization. Where home is supposed to be a safe haven from pandemic, Palestinians continue to face home demolitions and checkpoints. They are among the most impacted by the pandemic as they fight for human rights and self-determination. And so as we are all asked to self-isolate, we are being challenged to imagine a different future when this is all over. Not a return to normalcy, which didn't work for so many of us, but to a more just society, one that includes a vision for peace and justice in Palestine. And with that, I would like to introduce um, our four speakers. Um, so joining us today, we have Hadil Shatara from Samadun Prisoner Solidarity Network in Palestine. Um, and Hadil is based in Ramallah. And we have uh, Ra'ed Shakchak, who is joining us from Gaza. Um, from We Are Not Numbers. And then we have uh, Zogbi and Tare. Zogbi from We Am in Palestine. Um, and Tare and uh, Zogbi are based in Bethlehem. Uh, and so we, without further ado, I'd like to uh, jump in and perhaps uh, Hadil, you can actually start us off. Um, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, Yara, for this introduction, and um, thank you for this invitation. Uh, um, I hope everyone is feeling well and safe um, as we're facing um, coronavirus pandemic everywhere, and we're all in the same boat now, worldwide. Um, so I'm going to start talking about. Um, I'm going to be specific today. I'm going to talk about the prisoners and what the Palestinian prisoners are facing in the occupation uh, in the Israeli occupation prisons. Um, uh, first, there's uh, one more thing I want to say. Today marks the 72 um, anniversary of uh, the Deir Yassin massacre, massacre, where 360 Palestinians were murdered by, by Zionist um, forces. Uh, so now we're going to start talking about the Palestinian prisoners um, and uh, what they're facing now inside the prisons um, due to the um, coronavirus spread. We have more than 5,000 prisoners uh, in the Israeli jails, in the Israeli prison, uh, prisons um, all over Palestine. Um, these, uh, among these prisoners, we have 200 children under the age of 18, 43 uh, female prisoners, uh, and 700 um, prisoners who are facing um, various diseases. 
200 of them are facing chronic diseases with low immunity. Uh, with this said, um, and uh, noting that the prisoners are already suffering from um, severe conditions in the uh, medical wise in the uh, in the prisons and denial of ad ad adequate um, health care, um, the repression is increasing as the coronavirus started spreading. Once it was announced as a pandemic, um, the occupation took few steps to make their life even uh, harder. So. Um, they, um, for example, they denied all the family visits to the prisons. Um, they um, denied all the legal visits to the prisons. They seized all um, the prisoners inside their cells in most of the prisons right now. So they're infected um, uh, very much internally. And now they have denial of access to um, a lot of stationary supplies such as food and um, health equipment. Um, so they, they took from the prisoner's canteen where they can purchase this stuff inside the prisons, 140 different types of products. Uh, most of them are cleaning and um, food products. And the most important thing is the medical neglect that the prisoners are facing and the, the health care denial. Um, uh, for example, what happened uh, last week was um, they found out that two of the interrogators were um, uh, tested positive for coronavirus and they actually were with some prisoners. They, they said that they're taking these prisoners to quarantine. They told the families, okay, we're taking the prisoners into quarantine, but none of the family knew where their kids were uh, or in w which prisons or uh, were they in ho uh, held in hospital or in, uh, in a medical health center or anything. Um, to find out that um, this is not the case, they're locking them inside the prisons, inside a Ramla clinic, which is, we can't even call it clinic uh, inside the prisons. Um, then a few days ago, in March 31st, um, one of the prisoners was released. His name is Nuruddin Sarsour. Uh, and then when they took, when, when he um, arrived, they took him to, to do the testings for Corona. Um, they found out that he tested positive. Uh, and 14 other prisoners were took to quarantine without knowing what's really going on. And more, most of the jailers, and, and in Ofer prison, for example, now, um, three or four jailers are um, tested positive for coronavirus, who actually uh, were in direct communication with many of the prisoners there. So all the children in Ofer prison now are in quarantine. They can't even go out um, to the break they give them the prisoners get one hour break um, called al fura in Arabic, in Arabic. So um, now they're locked in the rooms uh, with no health care, uh, no sanitizers, uh, and nothing. And they're refusing to do the testings for these prisoners uh, for coronavirus. This is how the situation is right now. Um, so the prisoners started taking actions, started sending messages from the prisons, demanding their freedom, and um, especially in a Nakab uh, desert prison and in Ashkelon and now in Aufar, the prisoners are in Aufar are preparing for a, a hunger strike. Uh, we'll know more about it in the next coming, in the few coming days. Um, and all the messages the prisoners are trying to send right now are messages of demanding freedom. Uh, so um, this is, a, a, we took response with, as a community um, and as, um, <sighs> As a Palestinian community, we started campaigning to demand the freedom of all the prisoners. And now we're demanding the whole world to stand with the Palestinian prisoners uh, and join the campaigns where we um, demand their freedom from uh, all, of the, all of the prisoners' freedom, the 5,000 prisoners' freedom from the um, Israeli, um, the Zionist prisons. Um, this is the first thing we're demanding, and this is how the world can support by joining the call of freedom for all the prisoners. We're also demanding the Red Cross to take the responsibility because once the, pandem the pandemic started, the Red Cross did not take any serious action toward the, the Palestinian prisoners. They're keeping silent as they're always doing, they always do, but now it, it, this is serious and the prisoners' lives are um, in real danger and in severe uh, harm. So this is uh, the second demand we're demanding. We're also um, demanding to stop all the collective punishment against um, the prisoner's family and the prisoner, the Palestinian, the Palestinian prisoners. The whole world is telling everyone to stay home and stay safe while the occupation is tearing down and demolishing prisoners' houses and leaving their families out uh, or uh, in demolished houses and, and 
uh, with also uh, calling for uh, the freedom of prisoners and all of, uh, all around the world, the political prisoners who were demanding the freedom of George Abdullah after what we heard from the uh, French government of refusal, the refusal of uh, his uh, freedom while they're uh, freeing everyone else. Um, and um, this is mainly the situation in Palestine, and this is mainly the work we're trying to do um, for prisoners. And this is um, how the things are really, really hard. And um, all the things that the prisoners are facing now uh, are actually going to take us to um, a horrible situation if nothing has been done so fast and so soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hadil, for, for sharing that with us. Um, it's, it's really a challenging situation and, and really thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, Dr. Uh, Tarek and uh, uh, Zogby, would you mind going next and, and sharing with us the situation in Bethlehem? Oh, let me unmute you, there we go. Can you hear us now? Okay, very good. First of all, thank you again for this invitation and for continuing to do this very important work. And uh, hopefully, and being part of the equation or being part of the solution that will bring about justice for all. So of course, uh, here in We Am, we have, we were the first place that was put under quarantine beginning on March 5th, March 6th, when we had two positive cases that then turned into four and then it spiraled to some different cities. Um, from the very get-go, they decided, unlike many other places and cities around the world, that we would be placed under physical quarantine. We weren't supposed to leave the houses. There were roadblocks. There were physical barriers. And the citizens were required to stay home by the Palestinian Authority, of course. And then Israel had decided that it would close the borders or close the checkpoints that some Palestinians were able to use to move and traverse the different borders. When these measures first took place, of course, it brought back, back quite a bit of nostalgia for many of the Bethlehemites and Palestinians. We all recall the different times under which we were placed under siege, but this was the first time in our living history in which our freedoms and our rights to movement were being restricted for our own safety and security. Of course, it was for the protection of the general people and the general good. And of course, one of the reasons we had to use these measures was largely because of occupation and because of the policies, these oppressive policies that have limited the Palestinian economy's growth, but also the growth and development of different faculties, facilities, and sectors, including the medical facilities that we have. And so when we talk about this disease as was often said, it's not necessarily very dangerous or it's not as deadly as other diseases, but it does attack the respiratory system. And one of the problems that we face is we have a lack of adequate, uh, what are they called? Ventilators. Ventilators. And we have limited number of these and therefore this disease that isn't very deadly could potentially become more deadly if the number of people who are infected with corona was to exceed the number of ventilators or respirators that we had. And so this was one of the precautionary measures that was put forth. But of course, there are also consequences to this. When we talk about the Palestinian economy as a whole, over 70% of it belongs to the service sector. And it's a service sector that requires the most social interaction. And it was this sec sector that was hit hardest by these quarantines. When we talk about Bethlehem, we have over 80% of our economy belonging to the service sector, whether it be tourism, whether it be restaurants, whether it be different fields within the service sector. And that was hit very hard. And Bethlehem, much like all of Palestine, has a very high unemployment rate. Bethlehem used to be the highest in the West Bank, now it's the second highest in the West Bank at 31%. And this was prior to coronavirus. Now after coronavirus, the unemployment rate is probably around 70% or higher. Unfortunately, we don't have the adequate statistics during this time or the research. 
But when we also talk about employment and unemployment, it's necessary to be aware of the fact that just because a person is employed, that their employment, that the income they receive from that employment isn't necessarily enough to cover their needs or their family or their household's needs. When we talk about disparity, we're talking about a very high economic disparity between Palestinians, whether in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank and that of people living in the Israeli controlled territories. On average, we're talking about the average GDP in Gaza being around $800, $900 to $1,200. The average GDP in Bethlehem or in the West Bank ranging around $1,200 to $3,000 depending on the year. While we're talking about the average GDP um, per capita of Israel being up in the $32,000 to $37,000, $39,000 range with much of the living costs being very similar. And of course, we remain independent or remain dependent on Israel for our electricity, for much of our utilities in many parts of the West Bank, especially. And of course, on water, as 90% of the transporter water resources have been confiscated and occupied by Israel, and then a portion of that sold back. And so now what we have is these people, the Palestinian community with its high unemployment rate with its high food insecurity rate at one third of all households being food insecure and another third being at risk of food insecurity now being forced into their homes many people having to leave their jobs many people having to be let go because our institutions and our employers can no longer afford to be able to sustain them and pay them during this outbreak or during this time and so we see a rise in this food insecurity and so we see the Bethlehem locality, like much of the West Bank and Gaza, much of the Palestinian territories now being forced into this position where we must rely on our community more than ever. Luckily, we still have a cohesive community and a community that supports each other. And so largely what our community organization, what we am Center has been involved in is trying to create synergies between the different groups, trying to help and focus on meeting the needs of the most marginalized within our community, but also on being able to expand the network and other than providing physical support and providing their necessity or their needs as it relates to food. We also have to think about utilities now as most of our students have gone to virtual learning and so that also has an associated cost with it, but also talking about emotional and mental support. And of course, being able to deal with some of the conflict that arises from being forced to stay within the same area, to almost be trapped within one's own house or one owns one's own neighborhood during this time. And so working on being able to bridge the physical barriers that are put forth between differences between the different communities while also addressing the needs, especially of the most marginalized. And maybe you can continue. Yes, um, thank you again. I am glad to meet you because I am one of the founders of SAPI. So uh, that's really a blessing to see you. As uh, Tarek said, we are in a way another, uh, you know, in our homes. It's like imprisonment, but this time is a benign imprisonment. And we thank the Palestinian Authority, the people, the government, the medical teams, everyone who try to help our people to overcome this virus because uh, the lack of any modernity in our hospital, hospitals or any um, you know, um, up-to-date uh, medical supplies, testing uh, kits and so on, this is the only way is to confine to our uh, homes. Uh, but the situation is like other parts of the West Bank in general, but more in Bethlehem. Uh, we are more in a smaller prison, and with the Israeli occupation control, more than 87% of Bethlehem district. And the um, you know, unilateral actions and creating facts of Israel continue. For example, a few days ago, they blocked the way to Kremezan Monastery, which is part of Bethlehem, and uh, more settlement buildings, more outposts, um, you know, and expanding the outposts, 
Uh, and uh, on the top of that, what is happening to our prisoners, especially uh, as my, our colleague said, uh, no testing for them before or after they are released, if some of them are released, and the workers. The workers who are sent back to Bethlehem or Hebron, north and south, were not tested by the authorities. And this will increase the coronavirus uh, impacted in our society. Uh, the settler violence also is increasing and more destruction for our vegetation, for uh, different uh, places, uh, demolishing of houses continue. And uh, what's happening also in Jerusalem, for example, they imprisoned the governor and who tried to organize voluntary group to fight against coronavirus. So the occupation didn't stop its attack on us, even during this coronavirus uh, period. Uh, and on top of that, they are talking about annexation. Annexation, and now they talk about a medical annexation as a way to go into other annexation. And uh, just a few minutes ago, I read that the orders and the restrictions and the uh, things um, implemented by the Israeli authorities try to implement it on us on the West Bank uh, to talk about uh, regulations. So on top of that, also, Palestina suffered from family reunification. Now, many families uh, have, uh, you know, uh, sons and daughters or spouses outside the West Bank are not allowed, of course, before the coronavirus to be united. And now they are divided uh, families living in the West Bank under occupation, as well as in diaspora with stress, with th uh, thoughts home. So there is this kind of pressure added to the uh, coronavirus. It is not by surprise that we face coronavirus nowadays as part of the land season, part of the stations of the cross. As Palestinians, we have our daily stations of the cross added to it nowadays coronavirus. I'll stop here rather than to continue. And maybe I'll just add something small, but it's important to um, be mindful that we still have raids going on, even in these places that are under quarantine. And oftentimes when these raids occur now during COVID-19, You'll see the Israelis, of course, armed as usual, but now you'll see them also wearing protective gear to fight against corona. But once the Palestinian prisoner or detainee is taken, they are not afforded any of this protection. And of course, then they're thrown into these cells or into these um, administrative detention centers with other Palestinians. And then that's one of the ways that this infection can continue to spread. And with this, many of us, around the world, but especially in Palestine, we do believe that we will overcome COVID-19, will overcome this virus. But then the question becomes, when will we overcome this occupation? When will the world develop a vaccine to help us and to help all these marginalized Palestinians and marginalized people around the world? And luckily for us, we know that this conversation, your continued support and solidarity and that of the viewers and the continued work of these activists are part of that vaccine that we look forward to being able to use to further justice here in the future once we're done with COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you both so much for that and, and just that, that concluding um, sentence and that question um, I think really strikes the core of, of this conversation here. Um, so thank you. I am um, we actually had, uh, as many of you saw on the poster, uh, another speaker, um, and thankfully she's been able to join us. Um, there were some technical issues, um, but I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rand Escalon um, uh, here, and I'll get, give uh, Dr. Rand an opportunity to speak uh, next, and just to share that Dr. Rand is um, originally a Canadian doctor who moved to Ramallah um, and opened up a, a center, uh, a clinic called Taqween Center. And so Dr. Rand, I'll let you go ahead um, and share with us your experiences. Uh, hi everyone, I'm sorry for being late. 
um, as Yara said, I'm, I'm actually originally a Palestinian, uh, lived, in, lived and trained and worked in Toronto for 23 years as a pediatric neurologist. But I recently, I've been living now in Ramallah for three years, um, establishing a brain center for children. And uh, this is what I'm doing here. Uh, now for our topic, uh, do you want me just to talk about Corona in Palestine in general or their specific question? Uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you share, um, you know, whatever you feel is really pressing. I know that your experiences as a doctor, especially um, during this right. time there, uh, are really crucial. So basically our first case of corona or when everything started was in, in uh, March 5th and um, and this was actually the whole thing started because of a touristic group that came to Beit Lahan. and after they left and went, went back to Greece it was discovered that they were positive for corona so the authorities here went back and checked the hotel that they were staying in and all the people they interacted with and there were some positive cases. So really the core of Corona in Palestine started in Bethlehem. And immediately um, the authorities took action. They, uh, they basically closed down the Beit Sahur, Beit Jala and Bethlehem. Uh, and there was almost like a curfew over there. And, um, and this is how, how, and it stayed contained to Beit Lahem for, for some time. But then other areas in Palestine started to having corona cases because of the Palestinian workers going to work in Palestine 48. And, uh, and those were, they were, they're mainly working in settlements. So they would come back and, 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 and we, all we know in is in, in, in in, in Palestine 48, the, the, the corona was spread a lot in the settlements more than what the Israeli uh, authority would declare. And they would come back and, and, and there were some cases because of the interaction of these workers with their families and, their, and they're mostly from little villages. So it was, May, after Bethlehem, it moved to villages around Jerusalem. And then, then we had some villages in, um, around Ramallah. So now if you look where the co cases are concentrated, uh, Ramallah, Bethlehem are, are almost uh, bar, like they're very similar, then they have the, 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 um, the villages around Jerusalem. Then you have a few cases in the north, in Nablus uh, and in Tulkarim. Um, the total so far is 263 cases uh, positive, and the, uh, there's about 40 recovered. Uh, there is one death, although this death is not considered caused by corona. Uh, she was a woman, uh, and uh, she, was, she had multiple comorbidities and uh, she died of renal failure and she died really very quickly so it's it, it, but they still report that death as a corona death but if you talk in the medical field people know that it's not really a cause by corona. so so far and in the past 48 hours we didn't have any new cases in palestine so um the fear now and the worry is really still there about the workers coming back because we're going into the jewish holidays and we're expecting the total number of, uh, of reported number of workers working in Palestine 48 is, is uh, about 50,000. So that's a huge number. And we were expecting around, around 45,000 to come back. Now there are some negotiations between the Palestinian Authority and Israel uh, to about different scenarios. They either leave them there because these workers would want to go back to work after the holidays. So there, there's like no point coming here, quarantine and, and like really have all this uh, stress from, from, from having them. And then in a week later, they go back. So there's some negotiation about them staying there over the holidays. That has, we, we, don't, we don't know what is the exact scenario we're waiting to hear or 
they will send them, but they will send them in, in groups rather than everybody at the same time. Um, but so far, it's not clear how they're planning to do that. Um, uh, but this is, this is really where the anxiety is coming from uh, in Palestine about the, the source of cases. It is going to be from the Palestinians working in Palestine 48. But we're just waiting to see. In the last 48 hours were very encouraging, but people feel that, well, they're not back yet. So, so we, we don't know what's going to happen next. In terms of preparation, if you want me to talk about that, like how ready the country is. Um, yeah, and it's not, uh, I think there they can, I, I went around, I looked like, I went and visited the Beit Jala hospital, for instance, in, in Bethlehem. Today I was visiting Nablus. Um, they are ready in a, in a way if it is like few people coming, like, if they, if they if they don't come all in one in, in one huge number and the and the system doesn't get overwhelmed yes they can handle maybe five at a time 10 at a time maybe if you push it but they definitely cannot handle people coming in hundreds or thousands and this is where the, then the, the, the system will fall apart that's my own assessment uh, that's per the really personal assessment. Uh, I don't think the system is ready to handle huge numbers. Um, uh, but they're doing uh, the, the, what they can. Resources are scarce, uh, like pro protective clothing, protective masks are, are difficult. Many factories in the West Bank that used to do leather, leather products now turned into uh, making uh, protective suits. Uh, there are a few in, in Hebron, there are one in Nablus, and, and they're not, in terms of quality, they're, they're, they're asking these factories for, to follow certain specifications. So we are trying to be self-sufficient when it comes to uh, uh, protective uh, gear. Masks, there's a huge shortage. The biggest really shortage and the rate limiting step in the, in the Palestinian Authority ability to do testing is the swabs that you need to do the, the PCR testing. Uh, they are, they're not doing any many tests. In, in, uh, like the total test they've done since the beginning, since March 5th, is 16,000. That's really nothing. This is like, this is done in one day on the other side. Um, uh, uh, so it's not really a huge number. So maybe we didn't, now we don't have many cases, we are definitely under testing, but at the same time, if there are severe cases, then we will see deaths, which we haven't. So um, we might be uh, among the lucky populations that were not badly hit. They, there are many scientific theories about that. Some of people think talking about different strains of viruses in different populations. Some people talk about different immune system and genetic makeup, a viral exposure uh, uh, profile of, of different populations. But um, so far, alhamdulillah, we, Palestine ha, uh, is not hit hard. And uh, I hope we won't because if we, if we are going to be hit hard, we, it's going to be very difficult to cope with. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. I think we're all really hoping and praying that that, that con continues to be the case and um, that the virus uh, does not hit hard um, in Palestine and uh, particularly as well in, in Gaza. And, and that's, I think, the cue to, uh, for you to share the experience as well in Gaza, um, where luckily the cases have still been uh, on the lower side. So I'll let you go ahead and, and share. Okay, in uh, thank you. Because oh. um, yes. this is right. Uh, uh, I, I live, hi. Um, so I live here in Khan Yunus City in the Gaza Strip. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about what's happening here in Gaza. Well, you know Gaza, uh, it's been under the is really blocked for 14 years, and uh, because of this blockade, uh, not so many people can go out, not so many people can come in. So uh, this limitation of movement has helped Gaza um, deal better with coronavirus. Um, 
Gaza so far has got 13 people who got infected. And uh, out of those 13 people, none of them got cured. So four are remaining, you know, there in quarantines. And uh, the thing, uh, the thing about this is that all people, you know, whoever you are, when you come into Gaza through the border, you're taken immediately to quarantine. Like you don't have it in option, you know. So I, I think because Gaza and because of the history of Gaza, we're talking about wars. You know, Gaza has ha has had you know three wars, and um, those wars were very destructive. That they even destroyed hospitals and medical equipments and uh, they were fierce so uh gaza would not be able to handle you know an outbreak here uh, we're talking about over two million people here in gaza strip it's a very small area so there is no way uh, we were talking about doctors doctors in recent years have immigrated from gaza so we don't have enough qualified doctors so uh, I, I think this was a strategy uh, by the government to take everyone, all passengers, into quarantine. And uh, at first they would stay there for two weeks, but then they extended that to another week because they want to make sure that no one's going to get out of there, you know, being infected. Um, the situation here in Gaza, uh, you know, as always, you know, it's always been dealing with these really limitations these really hardships that Israel has always been putting on Gaza. So right now I'm hearing stories from the West Bank, from Bethlehem, from Jerusalem, from Ramallah. So I feel like all of us here in Gaza, like we're, we're sort of used to this. We're sort, we're sort of used to being isolated. Uh, we've been living in quarantine. Like, uh, like I'm 22, I've been living in quarantine for like, like almost my entire life. So I'm not even aware of a life that I can be 100% free. So to me, it, doesn't change a lot. Uh, the situation in Gaza, like, uh, because coronavirus took so long to get into Gaza, actually, uh, people here started to feel like it's not going to get into Gaza, you know, thanks, thanks to the Israel pocket. But uh, I remember that night, it was almost 1 a.m., uh, the government here announced that uh, we've got some two actually not some two people who got into Gaza from Pakistan they, they were infected so the whole Gaza Strip flipped out you know it's just like a war just got started so people actually started to act like as if they were in war so they started to go out buy groceries you know everything that would need so that they wouldn't have to go out for weeks and um, I think that's when people actually started to take it seriously before then they were like there's nothing it's called coronavirus COVID-19 is not even a thing. And uh, because they lived in denial, then two uh, cases were announced here in Gaza, people took that as a shock. So uh, the, the shock continued, more people got infected, we're talking about policemen, and then uh, people would seriously, you know, start to deal with it and carefully. So we've got schools, our, uh, schools are shut down, we're talking about universities, they're shut down as well. Uh, most of the offices and organizations in Gaza are shut down because we want to prevent, you know, any chance that coronavirus would spread here in Gaza and happen, you know, a potential outbreak. And um, at some point, uh, I think people uh, started to use things they never used before, to kind of like hand sanitizers, masks, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, even if, if you want to think of it, of it, like people here in Gaza, like wear masks, like, if you did that when we first heard of coronavirus, like, people would seriously make jokes about you. Seriously, they would make fun of you. But right now, everyone understands that it's no joke. And uh, recently, we've been getting good news from the... Uh, more people are getting cured. To be honest, personally, I find that, you know, astonishing. You know, here in Gaza, people are getting cured. Like, the number is decreasing, it's not increasing. I don't want to jinx it, you know, but... It is what's happening. So, so far, we've got only four people here in Gaza. And I think because of that, people start to feel like, well, it is safer right now. So I think recently, like, I've been quarantined in my apartment. Like, I didn't go out at all for three weeks. Uh, yesterday, I had to go out to the supermarket. And uh, I was actually surprised. I feel like I'm the only one who's been isolating himself, you know. I saw people like they're they're sort of living like normal life, you know, like sort of not completely. Um, the thing here in Gaza, um, we don't have enough enough equipment. Uh, we're talking about like uh, lab tests and lab materials and and all kinds. So, you know, 
it is unstable here in Gaza. And actually, the spokesman of the health minister here in Gaza, uh, he said that Gaza is getting to, to a situation where it doesn't have what it takes actually to deal with an outbreak, you know, or serious, like a serious number of people getting infected. So, uh, you know what they say, um, an ounce of uh, protection or actually prevention is better than a pound of cure. So to Gaza, that's the only option to avoid coronavirus. And um, you may take this as a surprise. I was surprised as well. But uh, if you want to talk about like how Gaza is dealing with this among, you know, the countries, uh, you know, of the world, uh, Gaza has been getting help. Uh, for so many years because we got so many, you know, the majority of us are refugees. Uh, but uh, recently with COVID-19, Gaza hasn't been able to get, you know, much help because all countries right now, like they're in the same spot, you know, they're all struggling with coronavirus. And uh, even the Palestinian government uh, there in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority, uh, it hasn't been giving Gaza enough money or enough equipment as much as it's been given the West Bank. Uh, Israel, Israel hasn't been helping at all, but uh, thank God isolation, quarantine has been, you know, an advantage in this point. But recently, um, we've, we've had this factory actually that changed the equation, and uh, it's like this word is like a fictional word, uh, where Gaza is actually supporting Israel. And what I, what I mean by that is that we've had this factory, uh, it's been working lately a lot. Uh, it's been actually shut down for so many years because of the Israel blockade, because Israel does not let, you know, high quality materials to get into Gaza. It's a closing, uh, you know, factory. But recently, Israel felt the need and it's been pressured by the public. Like, you've got to get us, you know, masks, clothes and uh, other material equipments that can be functioned here in Gaza, that can be made here in Gaza. So. Uh, Israel has finally allowed those materials to get into Gaza and there is this factory here in Gaza that's been working and th they're doing that actually for financial issues. We're talking about economic people here in Gaza, economically they're exhausted, you know. So all these people, like they start to work. The good side is that it's offering more job opportunities. We're talking about people here in Gaza who are living under poverty line. So uh, people here are working, they're making money. And they're exporting all those materials and, uh, you know, masks, clothes, whatever, to Israel because Israel needs that the most. And uh, I think uh, this current virus situation has been, uh, has been maybe a lesson to, to the whole world. Like Gaza has been living this for over a decade. It's come about 14 years. And if you couldn't feed Gaza now, like you would never, never feel Gaza because this is the time, you know, you're quarantined in your house, feel the Gazans. So to me personally, uh, it's not a huge change. Uh, I just couldn't go to the office. So right now I'm just stick at home. I'm sort of used to sticking here at home because basically I've got nowhere else to go. And uh, for the whole world, oh my, I feel so sorry for the whole world. Uh, it's been a disaster. Uh, so many people uh, couldn't survive that, unfortunately. But still, I think at this point, uh, the whole world needs to, you know, to be united. Uh, to stand together hand in hand to overcome this pandemic but of course once this pandemic is over like everything is getting is gonna get back to normal but gaza is gonna still be there under this rigid siege under this little block under the israel occupation and gaza is gonna still be you know being choked by these really hands and I, I think this is a call personally from me from gaza from right to the whole world especially to the Canadian people, the Canadian government as well. It is time to stand with Gaza. It is time to, to start to break this siege. It is time that Gazans, the Palestinians here in Gaza, finally feel free, just like the whole world. And um, I think I covered almost everything here in Gaza. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Ra'ed. Um, thank you for that, for sharing that. I one of the, the things I remember seeing circulating when this first happened was a question, uh, you know, dear world, how does it feel to be in lockdown from, from Gaza? Uh, and, and I remember feeling like this really resonated because um, it's something that Gaza has been going through for so long and, um, and what we really are hoping uh, for, like I think Tarek said uh, perfectly is, you know, 
what next once the virus is, is created and, and this pandemic is over? How do we get rid of, of the virus, of the occupation and the blockade? Yeah. And I really think, you know, uh, this, this particular panel has been extremely helpful in, in creating that conversation. Um, and, and I hope that we can actually spend some time now uh, with the Q&A session. Um, and in that, I hope that we can unpack this further, uh, trying to imagine what a future uh, without injustice is going to look like, because that's, we, we cannot return to normalcy after this, because normal uh, is, doesn't work for the most of us, for the majority of us, and especially for the Palestinian people. Um, and so we need to imagine something much bolder. Um, and so thank you so much for that. So um, with the q and I'm actually going to uh, just share a couple um, of guidelines for those that are joining uh, or that are uh, attending the panel. So um, there will be q and session, as you know, um, and for some, some of you have already started uh, sending questions, which, which is great. For those who might, might not have figured that out, there's a Q&A chat box right at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question, you can just click on that box and type in your question and submit it. Um, if, you, if you can, please specify um, if your question is for all panelists or if it's a specific, to a specific panelist at the start of the question. Um, and just, note, just to note that as the questions are being answered, uh, attendees will be able to see the question uh, as well as who asked it. Um, if you would, for any reason, prefer that your name uh, remains anonymous, just please leave a note at the beginning of your uh, question that, that you'd like your name to remain anonymous and that way we will make sure that it doesn't transition into the chat box. Um, okay, so I, we can begin uh, the Q&A. We've, we've gotten um, some, some great questions uh, already. So um, one question is uh, asking with regards to some of the coverage about the PA and Israel cooperating um, on dealing with COVID-19. And um, we, we do, however, know that this might not be a complete picture. And so um, Jerry is asking if you can comment about this, about potential cooperation between the PA uh, and Israel. I'm going to um, actually just unmute all of the panelists so that we can just have free conversation. There we go. So okay. I want... Perfect. There we go. go ahead. <laughs> uh, personally, actually, like with all due respect to to everyone who supports Israel, I don't think Israel is actually doing this you know cooperation with the Palestinian people for any sort of kind. But I think the only reason it does that is because of Israel, because they want to benefit Israel. They want to support their citizens, you know, there in Israel. I just talked about that factory here in Gaza. I just talked about the fact that Gaza has been limiting, you know, the entrance of equalities, uh, high qualities of materials in Gaza. And because of that, actually, um, we're talking about so many factors here in Gaza that got shut down. We're talking about so many people that lost their jobs because of that. But right now, Israel is actually allowing those materials to get into Gaza, but not for Gaza, for Israel. So uh, because I live here in Gaza, and I'm sorry, my, my mind is not as open-minded as all of you because I'm locked down here, but this is how I see it from my perspective. And um, I, I heard about uh, Israel and how they treat the Palestinian workers. And uh, I read actually some articles about that, and I saw that Israel is actually like they would never actually care about the Palestinian people. Like, I don't care if they're workers. I don't care what they do. I don't care about that. I, I don't believe that actually cares at all. So uh, you're talking about this. This is an occupation, okay? This occupation has been killing people, you know, Palestinians, girls, kids, uh, women, uh, men, old men, and they've been destroying our houses. I lived here in Gaza. I lived three wars, 2008, 2012, 2014. You know, they bombed everything. They bombed, you know, even the schools and they bombed the houses and they bombed the hospitals. So uh, I actually got zero faith, you know, uh, in this real occupation. Yet, however, uh, I really hope that somehow, some way, because of this really, uh, or because actually of COVID-19, this really uh, pocket on Gaza will be broken. And I hope this real occupation you know, we'll, we'll just, 
you know, give us just our simple rights. You know, I'm talking about human rights, you know, that's it. Okay, um, can I go? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the question was about the cooperation between BA and Israel. Um, okay, um, first let's think, of, let's talk about it this way. The security coordination never ever stopped between both of them, but is it benefiting the Palestinians or what's really going on here? Um, the occupation, the Zionist occupation tries to protect themselves all the time. And when they look at Palestinians, they look at us as a reason of spreading the disease to their community. So there's no real cooperation. The cooperation is continuing between the BA and the, uh, the, author the um, Zionist authority, but it's not gonna affect anything here. It's not going to make make us face the coronavirus pandemic better or anything. It's not going to help our health sector. We've seen what they did to the workers. So many workers, whenever they um, have a questioning about a worker that he's sick or um, there are some symptoms of coronavirus on him, they would throw the worker to a checkpoint for three or four hours for the Palestinian ambulance to come and get him. So this is, is this the, cooper the cooperation, the BA and the Israeli governments are talking uh, about or spreading the world that they're actually working together to protect the communities. It's not true and it's not real. And it's part of, um, we blame the BA for all of it, all, uh, for this cooperation because it's not to benefit the Palestinians. It's only, it's a favor to the occupation. And that's it, thank you. Um, okay, I'll just add a few things if I may. Uh, I certainly agree that the co if we want to call it cooperation, I could call it collaboration or cooperation, it's, um, it's basically, okay, let's allow them have, now we, now we see uh, Palestinian police having checkpoints, which we not necessarily saw before. And this is, of course, they wouldn't have been able to do that if they didn't get the okay from the Israelis. Why now we have Palestinian checkpoints all over, uh, all over the place? Uh, because, okay, they, they, are, they, gave him the, they gave them the green line to do that so that they can enforce the mass, the, 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 the shutdown in, in Palestinian cities. Um, but they're, they're certainly not doing that for, uh, to, to preserve Palestinian life or Palestinian health. They, wow. the, the settlers come down to the cities, they, they spit on the, uh, on the bank, uh, bank machines, the, the ITMs, they spit on the Palestinian cars, they, uh, they want to infect the population and scare them because everybody knows that the settlers have a lot of positive cases. So the settlers will, will come down to the, to the villages and basically touch the Palestinians, spit on their cars, spit on their ATM machine, to, to, to scare them and to, to try and, and, and we, they certainly have way more cases than, than the Palestinians and, 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 they, and they're not like, they're, they're saying this is, this is the, we, we want to spread the, the disease here as well. So it is certainly not a very healthy collaborative, it's way far than healthy collaborative relationship. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it's a relationship where okay, we may let few things get in, we will allow swabs to get in, certainly very limited number, nothing compared to the, what they have. Um, we will allow uh, some, we are still waiting for ventilators. We were told there are gonna be another 250 ventilators arriving to the West Bank. We've been hearing this since March. We don't know if this is happening or not. So it's, um, it's certainly not, uh, anything that, that, that something that when, when hits the world like this, when you think that everybody should be working together for humanity, that's not the case here. Well, if I may add a point, actually, uh, even if you think of Gaza again, uh, we're talking about like so many patients here in Gaza. So many of them are cancer diseases, you know, they're cancer cases. So if Israel, you know, all of the sudden wants to believe in humanity. So Israel, like, how come like you do not let Palestinian people in Gaza who've got cancer or any sort of cases like deadly diseases get into Israel or other countries to get medication? We're talking about like so many people here in Gaza who died because of that. They were never approved to get into Israel. You know, imagine that a piece of paper, it's called a permit. 
know, the Israeli pyramid would, you know, cost you your life. So like, how, how come is that different from coronavirus? You know, to me, it's the same. And to me, if you really believe in humanity and if you really want to all of a sudden start with the Palestinians because you want to, you know, fight COVID-19, it's not a way to do it. You know, you just, you know, you're doing it for yourself. You're doing it only for Israel and the Israeli people. That's it. Um, to echo some of the words that were said, we as Palestinians continually find ourselves in a catch-22. We're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. And that also is extended to quote unquote collaboration or cooperation. Um, but to further echo what they've all said, if we just look at the workers and the treatment of the workers, but also look at the different reversals that we've seen in Israeli policy since COVID-19. At the beginning, no Palestinian workers were allowed. And as Hadil said, we were seen simply as a people that would continue to spread and infect and spread this disease. And then as Israel's labor, there was an increase in demand, suddenly it was reversed and now Palestinian workers could come back so long as they weren't coming through the Bethlehem checkpoint. And then we had a further reverse. At the beginning it was any worker had to be over the age of 26 and they usually had to be married, especially if they were men to be able to go into Israel and work e legally. Then we saw that they were only looking for workers under a certain age, under the age of 50, under the age of 55. And so then recently, as they were saying, this is the time of Passover, of Easter, there was one um, policy in which all Palestinians were to be returned to the West Bank without any prior um, medical examinations or seeing whether they are carrying the infection or not. And then recently now, there was an article today in which it said, no, that they will still allow Palestinian workers back because they are in need of labor. And so what we see is Israel's policies or collaboration are there to serve their own political interests and at most protect their own people's security and not ourselves. In reference to what my father was talking about today, there was a decision that all of Area C which lies under direct Israeli control and all the shared roads would now have the Israeli police enforcing the policies that they're using within the Israeli controlled territories. But the em emphasis wasn't on security or security of the Palestinian people there. The emphasis was on the penalties and the fees that would have to be paid. And so the article said something to the tune of now all Palestinians in those areas or who move within those areas, if they don't meet the conditions that Israel has set forth, they will be liable to the penalties and fees under and in accordance with Israeli law. And the last point to bring out, during this whole crisis, we had our president and we had Mr. Ishtia and the spokespeople of the Palestinian Authority and government calling on Israel to protect and respect and enforce and provide security measures and protection to the Palestinian residents of East Jerusalem. And so these are people who are living under direct Israeli control, but yet they aren't given or afforded the rights and protections that we see afforded to many Israeli citizens. Mm -hmm. And so these are many of the other problems that prove or that show the difficult relationship but yet because of the system, this very oppressive system with this very heavy matrix of control, we are continually forced to abide by these policies that Israel creates. Damned if we do and damned if we don't, unfortunately, so far. You know, it is a simple equation. We're talking about an occupier and occupied and nothing ever is gonna change that, so. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think, um, you know, it's really important to hear this this side of the narrative um, because as as the question you know uh, tried to uh, tried to pull out is that this is what we're hearing from uh, Canadian media and and we really want to to understand the truth and so it's really important to make that distinction um, and and 
caring right now in the middle of a pandemic um, is very different than caring afterwards, right? And so um, right now we see this across the world where governments are sort of pivoting and making some changes to how they uh, treat oppressed populations primarily because they're concerned about spread. Um, you know, and it's really about, uh, it's about shifting our focus once this is over and saying, you know, we need to care about the situation all the time and we need to make these changes. And so thank you all um, for, for your answers. Um, another uh, question is actually, uh, with regards to the capacity of the Palestinian healthcare system. Um, and so there were, uh, there was some, I guess, I think it was Dr. Renz, you mentioned that the uh, virus is entering a health crisis, um, an existing perhaps health crisis within the Palestinian healthcare system. Um, and so uh, someone is asking, um, uh, you know, what, what kind of impact the virus will have um, if the healthcare system perhaps is already uh, in a crisis? Uh, no, I wouldn't say we are in a crisis yet. And hopefully we won't get there. Uh, the, uh, the number of cases are still very limited. Uh, as I said, so far we have only 263, 263 cases, already 40 of them recovered. Um, so it's less than that, than that now. Um, none, we don't have anybody on a ventilator. Uh, they are all mild to, to moderate cases. Um, uh, some, they're young, mostly young. Some of them are more than 60 years old. Um, so really, so far, it has been, uh, it's been un uh, manageable. Now, if, this sit, if, if it stays the same, then I think the healthcare system can handle it if it stays the same. Very few cases. Uh, like, as I said, last 48 hours, there were zero cases. Um, but if suddenly we have a surge in the curve again, and, and, and the fear would be the return of the workers, uh, and we now we start having hundreds of cases, uh, the picture will very quickly change. And then, yes, we will have a crisis, and I'm not sure that the healthcare system will be able to cope with it. Thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying. Um, we do have uh, another question, actually two questions um, that are a little bit similar. So um, the questions, uh, is do you see Israel using the cover of pandemic to deepen the occupation and to further its project of annexing the land and forcing Palestinians from their home and land? Um, and in what ways are they doing this currently? Um, and it seems and another person who asked this question pointed to uh, the reality that many countries around the world are very distracted at the moment with, with the virus. Um, and so, uh, if, if perhaps maybe Tarek, if you could start, um, somebody had noted, maybe you could answer and then we can go around. Sure. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Yes, unfortunately, it seems that the occupation seems to be immune from coronavirus. Um, and so during this whole period, we've received reports every now and then pictures of different places uh, in which they are still continuing to operate. We have um, them building the wall in different parts where there yet hasn't been a wall. We also see, as we said earlier, the Kremazan, one of the food basket areas of Bethlehem, one of the agricultural areas of Bethlehem municipality that has a monastery, a winery, and 50 other families, land, and homes now they've had the road completely blocked off. And so now they've divided that part from Beit Jala and from Bethlehem municipality. We also see the continual house raids. But of course, all of this now has taken second, third, fourth place to COVID-19 around the world and around the globe. And so coronavirus has been able to give the occupation, this blanket, 
Not that it has ever needed this because of the blind support of many of the Western or most influential governments and nations around the world, but it's added this further blanket that allows Israel to continue to pursue its own political interests and to continue with its oppressive practices. And so, of course, this also adds tension and it also adds fear. Many Palestinians question whether we'll wake up to a different reality after COVID-19. And unfortunately, many fear a darker or more bleak reality, especially for Area C and some of those areas that have less of a Palestinian concentration of people. On the political level in Israel, we see the two main parties that ran for the elections agree that they should annex uh, parts of the West Bank and to implement the Israeli law there. And uh, they are talking about having a united uh, or uh, government, unity government, and to implement more Israeli laws on the occupied territories, uh, gradually, sometimes taking the justification of Corona. Yes, uh, let's start with annexing parts of the West Bank uh, medically, and then they create more facts on the ground. The uh, settlements are um, increasing. Uh, there are more activities in these areas, and so we'll see uh, unilateral uh, acts by Israeli authorities. I may I add something to that effect. Also, there are like talks about if we get if the disease really spread in the West Bank, and the healthcare system cannot cope with it, which it won't if we get start having hundreds and thousands of cases then that would be an excuse to Israel to say, okay, we have to take over for health reasons. We have to take over because we want to protect our population. So, and they will annex and, and take over the West Bank and good luck getting it back again to, to where it was before Corona. So yes, there, are, there, is, there is this possibility of executing what the, the deal of the century, whatever that is, uh, uh, through Corona. So, very scary thought. Could you yeah. look like you wanted to, to jump in? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I, I want to say, yes, it's true. Um, the, the, the occupation is actually trying to, um, to control more, to have more control, and they're using coronavirus as, um, they're le legalizing by using the coronavirus um, pandemic. Uh, they're confiscating lands everywhere. They're tearing. The, they're demolishing houses. Two days ago, they just sent um, a, a family in a covert a town near Ramallah, um, telling them that we're demolishing your house. It's going to be tonight or tomorrow. We're we're anticipating. Uh, so they are using it, and things are getting worse. I also noticed um, one of the comments said the word apartheid. And what we're facing here is not apartheid. We're facing Zionist settler colonialism. Gaza is under siege. The West Bank is fully controlled by the occupation. And it's not that they're racist against the Arab community or uh, that way. It is settler colonialism and it's uh, Zionism actually. And this is Zionist theory they're trying to implement. They're trying to erase the existence of Palestinians. So I just wanted to know to that term apartheid, that it's not the case here. Thank you. Thank you, Hadid. Um, okay, so I think uh, it, this really, um, all of these answers have actually strengthened uh, all of our understanding and, and the importance uh, here in us not getting too distracted um, and staying in focus and continuing to keep our efforts on Palestine and not keeping up, um, especially at this time, because it's, it's quite clear that the occupation is not giving up um, and the coronavirus has not stopped the occupation. So, you know, our, our response can't stop amidst this crisis. So uh, thank you all for your answers. Um, another question which, which relates to this, uh, and I think has to do with some of the commentary around, uh, you know, the uh, the settlers uh, spitting on soldier or sorry the settlers spitting on um, machines and cars um, is the role the question about the role that the soldiers play 
um, in this, the uh, Israeli, the IOF um, occupation forces, um, and and how they respond, whether they arrest settlers for breaking the law or whether they're actually complicit and work with the settlers. Uh, Rand, I see you shaking your head, no, they don't arrest them. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> no, they don't arrest the settlers. They actually protect the settlers and they, they certainly will not move a finger to protect the Palestinians. And they let the settlers do whatever they want. And I've, and I've seen a lot of instances where the, the army is actually scared of the settlers more and more than it's the opposite. So uh, no, definitely not. They're not, uh, they're not gonna uh, punish the settlers for what they're doing. I've never heard it happen before, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think just to add a little bit to that, one of the difficulties or problems that Israel's facing now is that the government has kind of lost a bit of control. I mean, you have, since Israel's creation, you've had these extremist pockets that have been supported by the government and have been given the green light to go and wreck havoc and to go against international law and to do as they please for the purposes of moving that Zionist colonial vision forward. And so what we see now is because that has been such a widespread practice in some of these communities that it's not necessarily even about Palestine anymore when it comes to Israel being able to control coronavirus within the Israeli controlled territories, they're finding it very difficult to force their population and some of the more religious and Zionist populations to remain at home. This extends within Israeli society, but also within Palestinian society, within the settlements that have been erected on Palestinian land. And so unfortunately, Israel has done very little, if anything, to stop from spreading coronavirus via the settlers. And so it falls on the Palestinians and it becomes our responsibility. And we had our president and many of our PA spokespeople and spokespersons asking our workers, please do not go and work in settlements. Please do not interact and come into physical contact with settlers. Because now that's the only way we can protect ourselves in this situation in which the responsible authorities or the authorities which are supposed to be responsible for this, Israel, are doing nothing, unfortunately. So we hope the Arab world and other parts of the world will support our workers not to work in the settlements and to provide them with the necessity necessities. Uh, this is a dream, but I hope the Arab world and other uh, democratic forces in the world will listen that our people are in a big prison, small prison, and we need to be free. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm a Palestinian. I live here in Gaza, but uh, did, if you ever think about the West Bank, what's going on in the West Bank, uh, like if you talk about the, those so-called settlers who, who go there and uh, commit actually crimes, so... Um, uh, I don't think the Israeli uh, army would ever even point a finger at their citizens because, uh, I mean, look at what their citizens have done in recent years. Uh, we're talking about uh, burning the house with an entire Palestinian family in it. We're talking about Ahmed al-Dawabsh and his family. They got away with it. We're talking about uh, um, Muhammad Khdair, also from Abu the West Bank. Abu Khdair. sorry. Muhammad Abu Khdair, Palestinian kid in the West Bank. He was tortured to death. You know, it, there by the Israeli citizens. So uh, if you ever think about that, like they've done that. He was burned. He was burned. Come again? He was burned. He was burned, actually. Yeah, he was tortured. Like he was burned, you burned, know, to death. Yes. So like he got away with all of that. Right now, do you think the Israeli army is going to actually point a finger at his citizens, you know, who actually go and try to spread coronavirus in the West Bank? I don't think so. And, uh, you know, here in Gaza, we've had this great, mar great deter march. It lasted for like almost two to three years, two to two years, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking about like tens of people, tens of hundreds of people who, were, who got shot, you know, by the Israeli army, by the Israeli snipers, you know, they always get away with it. You know, they live for hurting us. They live for killing us. They, they live, they just want us like out. 
seriously they want us out of the map and then they would do, they want to do whatever they want to do with the land so uh that's my answer yeah and and i think um a key a key piece there is is actually that um the the soldiers that are near the settlements the reason that they're there is to protect the settlers um you know and and that's one of the things that is the unfortunate reality of of um, and it's very intentional of settlements is that not only do you get a settlement uh, on what used to be Palestinian territory and Palest a Palestinian village, but you also get everything that comes with the settlements, so the walls, the checkpoints, on the soldiers. And so, um, you know, the 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 presence of the the soldiers there is, is very. Uh, it, the real goal of it is to protect the settlers and and not by any means. Um, to protect Palestinians, and and I think we have, uh, you know, one person has commented um, that it's really been exactly as it's always been, um, and that the Israelis uh, have continued to to do what they've always been doing, and that and she's asked, you know, why why would would they ever uh, would anyone think that they'd be interested at this point in protecting Palestinians? Uh, when deep down inside, they have been working uh, constantly to to uh, annihilate them and everything that's connected to them. And so I think that that's really, um, you know, that, that question, I think, embodies the conversation that we're having, which is just um, that, that there is no uh, desire to protect Palestinians. Yeah. Palestinians. I, 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 know, I know the Canadian people are not familiar with what's happening here. But uh, seriously, if anyone, not, not only the, the Canadian people, if any people on this earth, like they want to learn more about the Palestinian people here, the Palestinian situation, specifically talking about Gaza, uh, like we are not numbers, this institution that I work for, I'm the outreach coordinator, by the way, uh, we wrote so many stories from here, from Gaza, so many stories from the West Bank, from Lebanon, you know, from the Palestinian refugees and Palestinian camps over there. So uh, you just have to go to wearenetnumbers.org and over there you're going to have tens and actually hundreds of stories. And that way you're going to be able to learn and hear actually directly from the Palestinian people about what's happening here. So certainly that's one way to go for it. Thank you, Raid. I'll make sure also to share that link with everybody afterwards. Um, so that everyone can access it and read the stories. Um, we have a question as well from Wendy uh, Gishru um, from the United Church. And so Wendy's asking to all the panelists, especially in Bethlehem and Gaza, are there any restrictions on accessing financial contributions to support your work aside from physically getting to the banks? Wow. Um, well, here in Gaza, like, again, back to the numbers, uh, because it is an NGO here, and uh, what we do is storytelling. You know, they're written and uh, they're, uh, you know, in videos and other formats. So basically, we need money. We have fund, and uh, every year we have this annual fundraising campaign. And our co-founder right there in America, her name is Pam Bailey. So she receives the money, and uh, every time she wants to send the money to Gaza, she actually gets plopped. Uh, she gets denied on uh, on basically every platform she uses. So I'm not quite sure what's the case with that because it is Gaza and because uh, uh, companies like Western Union and other companies that you know transfer money, they would actually accuse her of supporting terrorism here in Gaza. So uh, this this is not new. You know this has been going on. You know for you know, for a long time. So uh, I think when you talk about financial aid, financial support to Gaza, it's very restricted. And um, every, every time you have to figure out a way to, to get money and to support our NGO. But then like after one attempt, two attempts, then that's it, it's gone. You gotta figure out another way. So, uh, I, you know, every, every, every time they use this one excuse, this same excuse every time, you're supporting terrorism, mm -hmm. and uh, that's it. Would like to thank Wendy and many people who are in Kellen and elsewhere, who are uplifting our spirit and empowering our walk, and supporting us, uh, you know, spiritually, 
and uh, in partnership because uh, such partnership give us more meaning for our work and give us hope. I, I think we, uh, with the situation, uh, we, we don't have any problem in receiving, uh, especially those of us uh, in Bethlehem area, we are not confining to the self-restriction because we are trying to respond to the needs of the local community through psychosocial support, through also try to provide some basic needs for the needed families. And we are doing it. And I think uh, nowadays the authority is uh, giving um, a kind of uh, freer uh, decision for the banks to open from time to time and people could organize that rather than to be in num big numbers, but one by one to deal with this issue. But I like really to emphasize that this kind of solidarity, empathy, is really giving us more hope uh, to continue with this less traveled road. Just to add a little bit to that, while we don't necessarily see any added restrictions to our ability to access funds, in Bethlehem, it's important to note that it is much more difficult to access funds here and have these transactions than it would be in most other countries around the world. And that's largely because of the control that Israel has over these channels. And also where you have, or you're put in a position where you have to almost justify any transaction, any wiring, opening of any bank account. But another further difficulty or challenge that we're facing during this time is the drying up of funds. And I think this is something that I and other people may have said during this conversation, but as the world moves to focus on fighting COVID-19 within their own communities, we lose some focus on the Palestinian communities, whether in West Bank and Gaza, and also with the loss of tourism and the loss of this connection, what we see is that the Palestinian community itself yes. has to rely on itself much more than ever and try and be creative to meet the needs of the people, especially as it relates to being able to find sources of income through job creation, even under COVID-19, under this quarantine, but also in being able to create these networks that allow our community to support itself, maybe moving around of some products of some additional resources so that every person's need in that community is met, even with these difficulties. Thank you. Thank you, Tadet. I, um, I think that actually leads us into um, another question, which uh, there's, there's been a few versions of this question. So one was specifically for Ra'id, which is, what does it mean for Canada to now stand with Gaza politically, financially, emotionally? Given the information you've shared with us, what would you like to see happen? And there's been another question around um, solidarity um, and what, what, um, what folks on this panel think would um, really constitute uh, the solidarity that you want to see during this time. And so Ra'id, I'll let you, I'll let you um, start with that. Okay, um, so b because we're here in Gaza, our lockdown, uh, we sort of feel like the whole world is going, you know, the earth is rolling and we're just in there. Nobody even cares about us. Nobody knows about us. And, uh, well, we cannot deny that this is partially right, uh, but there are other people who actually care about us. So what helps us actually feel better? What helps us actually motivate our writers to write more stories from Gaza to the world is that the fact that some people over there read and when they read, they react. And when we receive the reactions, you know, you know, they they help they help us heal up and stay alive. So uh, I know, like, I wouldn't be crazy, like, like, how how do I expect people in Canada to come here together to support us? I know that's almost impossible. But you know, we're not, you know, like we're in 2020. So I think people over there uh, can support us by protests, uh, online campaigns, uh, supporting Palestinian people here in Gaza and outside Gaza, international students, for, for instance. And uh, just let us know that you're there for us, that you read our stories, 
that you, you care about is that you want to do something to break the siege on Gaza. Um, for instance, like one of the ways to do that is um, we're going to have, you know, we, we are not numbers. We're going to have uh, this annual fundraising campaign is going to start in Ramadan. And basically, this is the only way to fund our project. And our project helps so many youths here in Gaza to express themselves in a positive way. So uh, that's going to be like one way to, to support women at numbers, to support us, to support youth over here, you know, by making donations to it, you know, when the campaign starts in Ramadan. So uh, I think that's one way. Uh, some people over there maybe have better ways, like if you're working in hospitals and medical fields and, you know, stuff like that, maybe you can contact people to send more, you know, medical equipment to Gaza, medical tests, medical materials, and so on. So I think everyone is in his or in her field, and I think everyone knows better how to help out. Uh, if you're working in media, if you're a journalist, you can actually tell the truth about what's happening here in Gaza. So I, I think this question is too broad to actually answer it. So my answer is going to be simple. Uh, you're in your field. You know what you can do best. So uh, I, I think you could be creative and you could, you know, support the Palestinian people everywhere, specifically in Gaza, in the best way you can do. So, uh, and by the way, like, seriously, uh, if, Yanni, when people actually uh, read our stories and comment on them or share them or, you know, give us feedback or opinions. You see these simple things, you know, this is what drives us to keep going, seriously. So do not underestimate any attempt to, to stand with the Palestinian people because any, any attempt, however, or whatever it is like, you know, we don't care if it's simple, it helps. So uh, that's it. Can I carry on from where Ra'ad left? Uh, when we talk about solidarity, we don't, we don't always talk about financial solidarity or financial help or funding. It's important, but as Palestinians, the, more, the solidarity we're actually also looking for is how the people can affect their government and um, their political bodies, and especially the economic bodies because they're benefiting a lot from the occupation to stand with the Palestinian cause, to stop uh, protecting um, the occupation. Um, so we want them to take a stand, to join the boycotting movement as a movement that, uh, when, we're talking about, when we're talking about boycotting um, the occupation, we're talking about standing with the right to return for all of our refugees. We're talking about freeing all of our prisoners and um, returning to our country and gaining our freedom from the sea to the river. So this is the type of solidarity we're looking for from the world or from the people of the world, because we know what the governments, or what most of the governments sit in standing. So this is the type of solidarity we're also talking about. We're not only talking about funding solidarity, even if it's important. So this is what I wanted to add. And if I may also add I... something to that. Sorry? Go ahead, sorry. Okay. Um, I think it's also important that we make a few distinctions when it comes to supporting the Palestinian people, we're ju not just asking for relief or to do things that help support the Palestinian community. We're also asking to work on the political end and the political sphere. We need to make sure in this time in which existence is resistance that we are able to truly help the Palestinian community continue to exist. But we also want to make sure that we're not setting us up for dependence on international aid or on the communities for the rest of our lives. We would like to be free. We would like to stop wasting the resources that are being used to solve this very easily solvable problem. We'd rather use these resources to feed the hungry, to fight against disease. But what we need is for the world to take a courageous stand against occupation, against oppression. And with this, we also need to dispel some myths. To stand for Palestinian rights isn't to stand against Israel. It is to stand against Israeli occupation, for sure, and against injustice, but it says nothing about a stance against or for the Jewish people. The Jewish people are brothers and sisters. They are part of our Abrahamic faith community. 
But within that, we must also be courageous enough to call a spade a spade. We must be able to say this is oppression, this is occupation, and this must end. This is no way for either people to live. Within this also, we have or we live, and you may experience this more in Canada than we do, but in this era where anti-Semitism has become a weapon and it's being used for things that aren't actually anti-Semitic. I know some of the legislation in Canada has changed and it's basically caused the reality in which to stand against Israel or to criticize Israel's occupation is deemed as anti-Semitic and that's simply not true, but it's also telling of a very fragile relationship that these countries have with their history and with their Jewish communities. And so this isn't just a call to stand up for justice, for rights and for the Palestinian community, but it's also to strengthen the bonds that we have with our Jewish communities in the West. And this means that I'm able to speak vocally and courageously with the Jewish friends that I have, with the Jewish community that I may be part of and say, no, we must fight for justice. So, and then when I am labeled an anti-Semitic, that I know that the relationship is strong enough that we are able to talk through it instead of me shying away and carrying away from the conversation. And so within this, we need to make sure, again, that we are able to support the Palestinian community. And we must also understand that there's a difference between the tools and the ends. You know, there's the BDS, there are many different movements, and they're very important but we must also remember that they are tools to meet the end of occupation. The goal is the end of occupation and every one of us can do something to help further that goal. And then again, we must remember that ending the occupation doesn't equal justice. It's just one of the first steps on our path to justice. And that we're not sure where the road will lead or how it will take us, but that it's worth exploring and going on it together for justice for all. And uh, looking at some of the notes from uh, friends, like Bob Asali, Bill Johnson, uh, Bill Jansen, uh, Wendy, and I think all of you have been in the struggle for justice for a time. And uh, I tip my hat for all those who support the uh, movement for freedom and for justice, regardless to their faith, to their nationality, and to their uh, religion. Yeah, maybe one add uh, to the people. I'm talking about like simple people. Um, I know so many people around the globe would be like, well, I'm just a simple person, you know, what can I do? Uh, I, I went to America. In America, they say, we the people. You know, it means like the people has got the power. And uh, I think nobody should underestimate their, uh, you know, their power, you know, what they can do, what they're capable of. So I think at some point, if someone decided to, uh, to start up, you know, a movement to, to break uh, the occupation, to, to break the pocket on Gaza, and I know so many people did that, so many people are still trying, I know that. But uh, I, I think the more the attempts are, the more the pressure is. And that pressure is not only on the Israeli government, it's also on your government, wherever you are. It's on governments everywhere. So um, I, because I get that a lot, because so many people will be like, like they underestimate themselves and what they can do because they're simple people. Do not ever underestimate what you can do. A simple post on social media can make a change. A picture you can create or a video or any sort of media you can do, you know, that's a change. And uh, it could be, you know, the first stone to, to build a movement that somehow, some way is going to pressure the, the international community to actually break the block here on Gaza. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaid. I think that that's, you know, that's so, so, so powerful, just that we do have the power as people. Um, and, and we have, we, when we come together, um, we are able to make these changes and we, we need to, to be steadfast um, uh, and, and continue to move to make these changes. So thank you. Um, Rand, you wanted to say something in response to this question before. Uh, 
Did you still have something on your mind? Yeah, I think there, there oh, was what I wanted to say. Um, yes, uh, the, the political support is, is, yeah, donations, everything. And, I, and I, I, I worked in philanthropy. I'm still working for a long time. They are important, but I think uh, the, the, we need to call things what they are. We need to call occupation, occupation. If the Canadian government want to support the Palestinians, then they have to call Israel as an occupier uh, of Palestine. Nothing else, no other description for Israel's presence on the Palestinian land than, than an occupier. So uh, when they start calling them for what they are, then we have a starting point. Uh, and then we, we can go from there and say, okay, if it's an occupation, then it has to end. It's the only occupation now uh, uh, present. And, and then we start uh, the, 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 the journey for justice. There's no uh, peace without justice. If they want peace, they have to give us justice first. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we have time for just a few more questions. And there's one question here that, that hasn't been uh, a general question, just around whether the World Health Organization is able to do anything for Gaza or the West Bank um, and where the World Health Organization stands um, in the midst of all of this. Um, so I don't know if anyone has uh, any thoughts around that or experience with the WHO. Um, in one of the statements, the WHO said that they're gonna get all the medical materials um, to Gaza but this is all we, we heard from the WHO so far. And they said they're gonna be supporting the Palestinian Ministry of Health and um, the Ministry of Health in, in Gaza, but this is basically all of what we heard. Thank you, Hadiya, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, it, it's sort of been captured in some ways that, that uh, there, are some statements coming out and you know perhaps even some strong statements but ultimately that um this is really kind of not the first thing that a lot of these international organizations uh, are focused on at the moment and and that's why we need to step up as people um and, and be the voice and and especially when it comes to political actions um with you know here in canada or in the us or in europe i think we have people all across the board that have joined us at the moment and so just really that we have to be um we have to be the people who act at this moment um, and so and we do have um another question which is uh actually from from a member of our board curtis uh, who's asking how are people feeling about the restrictions preventing them from gathering for worship in this religious holiday season? It is not easy, especially for Easter. Um, and uh, we are in the Holy Week. And today is uh, Monday, Thursday, and tomorrow, Good Friday. And uh, our homes becomes our uh, place of worship. The spirituality comes through staying healthy, as well as connecting with your inner feelings and with, the, with God through other ways. And so we uh, have, it is not easy. This reminds us with the siege for Bethlehem uh, during the second modern uprising, where it was imposed on us the curfew for 40 days, you know, and it was not easy. So uh, we are accustomed to that in a way or another, uh, but this time is self-restriction and it is for our uh, health benefits, uh, not together uh, in big numbers for, and thanks for the social media and for the new technology that help us to uh, attend services through watching it through uh, the computers, uh, telephones and TV. Um, we hope that uh, uh, this uh, virus will be defeated, with, especially with the resurrection that Christians, Palestinian Christians in Palestine celebrate, that Jesus has resurrected from death, and our people will resurrect against virus, the virus, 
as well. We hope that we will overcome the injustices of the occupation and end the occupation in a package deal, in a way or another. And hopefully, uh, we, we hope that these days will be the last of uh, the virus, but we need to prepare for after the virus to help the people to stand tall and to have hope and continue their struggle. One of the things we emphasize when people come and visit is we say, don't just come and visit the holy stones, the dead stones, come and visit the living stones, the people, and see the rolling stones of the situation. And this thing that we say has taken a newer meaning during this context, and we are reminded, whether Christian or Muslim, that these holy sites are important, these churches, these mosques are important, yes. but our spirituality isn't just confined to them. And now our spirituality has evolved and changed, and our spirituality, our celebration of life, our celebration of our Creator is now in the relationship and concern and love that we share for each other. And with social media, this has completely changed the game in a sense. Of course, many churches, many different religious centers are able to broadcast their services, but also one of the special things about Easter um, is that we make these special cookies. And you know, I've seen different mm -hmm. posts on Facebook. One of them, a Muslim friend said, the worst thing about coronavirus is I can't go to my Christian neighbor and get these cookies. And then two comments later, one of his Christian neighbors went and sent cookies. Another family, there was a Christian poor family. So the Muslim neighbor went and brought eggs, went and bought some of the necessities and gave it to the Christian family so that they can enjoy their Easter. And so whether it's occupation or whether it's coronavirus or any other thing, we are a very resilient people, Christian and Muslim, and we will not let that get in the way of our celebration of life and our spirituality. So we wish you all happy Easter, and hopefully that Ramadan will be coming when the epidemic will be overcome. Inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> also wish the Jews happy Pesach, not, you know, and uh, hopefully that uh, the voices of justice will prevail on every religion level. Thank you. Um, Lula, I think you, you wanted to also uh, ask a question as well. Mm -hmm. So for those of you um, who missed the introduction, I'm a board member of Canadian Friends of Sadil and uh, my role actually was not to talk or, or, or share anything. Actually, the whole goal of this was to amplify your voices, uh, which, which is wonderful to hear. And I hope we'll have many opportunities in the future to, to check in together uh, and, and see how you're doing and, and to get all the latest updates. Um, so, so thank you all for sharing your realities and what you're um, uh, up against, both in, in, in the, the regular, unfortunately regular situation um, in your, in your uh, fight for freedom, justice and equality. And um, I think it's been wonderful to hear um, everything, all the work, the wonderful work you're doing and also to hear from our Canadian uh, friends here about how they've already established strong links with you. I know Canadian Friends of Sibid has, has already uh, done a lot with, uh, in support of Gaza, with supporting the medical system there, helping to raise funds for purchasing solar panels at um, the Al Ahli Hospital there. And we continue to try to amplify the voices of, of many organizations. Uh, and in particular, to try and reach the, the, the churches um, and the Christian community so that they can work within their organizations as well to help amplify your voices. So um, we'll certainly be sharing the links and, and all the information so that people can, can continue to support. And Canadian Friends of Sibyl, Sibyl will continue to uh, act as a, as a strong resource to help people to, um, to, to get the information they need and to provide the support that they can. But I had a question now, or, or, or I guess a request from you, um, Knowing how resilient and resourceful uh, Palestinians are in, in dealing with decades of, of uh, lockdown and, and restrictions and, and so on, 
maybe you could share with us a few words of advice to us who are now starting to experience the imprisonment that and the, the shutdown that you feel all the time. And maybe you are actually well equipped, unfortunately, is, is the ba- it's a bad word to say, but you've experienced it more than we have. And maybe you can share with us a little bit about how to, um, um, to weather this, uh, knowing that we, of course, will only weather it for perhaps a few months, uh, whereas you've been trying to uh, endure this for, for years and decades. So maybe you could share with us a, a couple of points, um, and especially uh, Dr. Rand, if you could share with us with the, when it comes to children too, how to help children deal with the, the implications of some of what they go through under s- severe restrictions. Um, okay, uh, your, your question like is, is two parts in terms of restriction in, in general. Uh, I mean, there is a resemblance of what is happening to the rest of the world being confined to their homes. Uh, it is kind of, our, our restriction is, is different. Our restriction is kind of, we are restricted because of an identity. We have restricted because we are simply not allowed to exist. Um, that has a very different um, uh, coping mechanism than being restricted at home uh, in your uh, knowing that this is this is temporary and yet the resemblance is being uh, your freedom of movement is taken away from you you're, you're you're not free to live your life the way you used to that is the resemblance between the two restrictions and uh, the way to cope to cope with it for me personally i i was just rationalizing all all my steps so i i did not let this um make me feel like my freedom was taken my my freedom of movement was taken away from me and my ability to think and being creative of how i can use this time and how can i contribute while sitting in my in my house uh, and one of the things that okay, let's stay connected with my patients through the internet. So we starting have we start having a, a, a sessions with the children uh, uh, through uh, through the internet. So and this was very important uh, because my patient population are kids who have uh, either brain pro- like uh, neurological problems or behavior problems like autism and ADHD and and they're driving their parents crazy being confined to these spaces all the time and changing their structures, especially the autistic kids. So it was very, it was a lifesaver for the parents to say, okay, we can help you through the internet. And we start talking to parents and the kids and, and continue with the therapy, with the therapy sessions. This was my way of thinking, okay, how, how can I use this? How, how can I make something good out of this restriction the center because it's a it's not an emergency center it's not emergency medicine at some point they closed all private private um, clinics you know, how can i can, how can i reach out to my patients and still help them that was the, my coping mechanism with this otherwise i would probably have really uh, couldn't cope with it because I will feel very desperate and very ho- uh, helpless about what to do about this. But this gave me a way of staying connected. And I think this is one way of how people can cope with is to find ways where they can actually use what, what looks like a very unfortunate circumstances and find a way around it to, to be helpful and, and to, to stay connected with the, with the people they care for. Uh, and, and I think this, this helped me a lot. And I'm sure people, when they find ways like this, it can, it can help them um, uh, cope with, with the change in their lifestyle. And being temporary is a huge difference also because the, 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 conf- the restriction that the Palestinians had had been a very 70 years. Uh, uh, this is, we all think this is gonna go away. Yes, a few months maybe, that can, can sound a long time, but nothing compared to how long the occupation was and still is. So um, that is also a comforting idea of this is being a temporary. 
So these are the kinds of thoughts that sometimes go through my mind when I'm trying to, um, to, to understand this and, and cope with this change and, and a huge change in, in, in people's lifestyle. Um, in terms of the children, I would say, generally speaking, the most important is to keep them busy and to be creative in making them busy. Uh, uh, we as parents, especially if both parents are working, uh, sometimes we don't spend enough time with them as much as we, we should. Maybe we will have to, this is like catching up time. And, uh, and I hear this from a lot of my friends, but uh, uh, come up with activities with them, fun activities, spend time, and and uh, and and make them make uh, like ch challenging skills even if it, like we always i always tell the parents like pl play games with them that are stimulative and fun at the same time so they will keep they, their their brain keeps stimulated and because they're out of school now uh, use part of the day to do some school work uh, and and so on so it is keeping the kids busy uh, whether fun activities or 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 stimulatory and um, to, uh, school activities. Thank you, Hadid. You had something to say. Um, I just wanted to say that when the quarantine started around the world, the Palestinians started joking, like now the whole world is feeling like how we are feeling every day. <laughs> um, I'm just saying to be occupied, um, help each other. There's a lot of people in need. Um, there's a lot of time to do a lot of activities, supporting other communities. It's time to learn about the world. And there's a lot of things to do. So this is basically. And I wanted to comment on the South African gangs who are assisting the society now. Uh, and so someone made a comment, Martin. I think, yes, you are dreaming. I don't think the settlers or we can't put the Jews in this in here because we have to differentiate between the Zionists and the Jews. So I'm gonna uh, shift it. Uh, the Zionists and the US uh, who are support the US government to be specific, will not turn the corner uh, and help the, help the Palestinian society. In South Africa, gangs are different because gangs are uh, facing apartheid until now. And you can't look at the gangs at, at, as uh, the way you're looking at other they're fighters, actually, not gangs, most of them, so. Thanks, Thank you. It, this is in reference to uh, a question that, that hasn't, because we're working on it, but we're, we're kind of we're discussing uh, the, the question Rula posed. So this is a question that we're seeing on our end, um, but hasn't been uh, centered, but it had to do with the question of whether settlers would uh, turn a corner. And so thank you, Hadil, for, for clarifying. Um, but, uh, it, Tare and Zogbi and Rae, did you have any thoughts on, on Rula's question uh, before we wrap up? Um, well, because we've been here in Gaza, we've gone through three major wars, countless war battles. So uh, I think uh, patience comes number one. You need to be patient. Uh, you try to not panic, don't panic. And I think the best way to cope with that is to stop thinking. And uh, but when I say stop thinking, I don't mean that you act like an idiot. I mean that you seriously don't overthink. You try to get yourself busy. You try to do things to focus on what you have, the, the advantages of the situation, and you try to make the best out of it. And uh, this is basically what we do. Uh, one of the things that Ryan said is that uh, here in Gaza, uh, or actually anywhere, uh, you gotta work with the kids, you gotta keep them busy. Here in Gaza, I remember like whenever we have like this street work, lens stark and, and uh, my whole building would be shaking and the, the sounds of the explosions and uh, it's really horrifying. Like nobody's not gonna be, you know, not afraid. You know, everyone is afraid. So uh, personally, what I used to do is that I would grab my laptop, put it there, get my headphones, put them on my little sister's ears and, you know, watch a Disney movie or something like that. So I think it is important to raise awareness. Uh, it is important that people know how to deal with this, even children. Like we never lie to our children. Like our children know that we get pumped, houses get demolished, people die and get injured. We tell them about that, but in, in the right way like stories, like you tell your child, you don't go out because you don't want to get sick. You know, you, do, you don't want to 
uh, you know, get hurt. This is how you tell your kid. You, you don't tell them like you're gonna cut into pieces because of an Israeli uh, rocket. So basically you gotta play the smart, you know? And for you as an adult, uh, stop thinking too much. Uh, you know, you're right now you're in quarantine. Here's what you do. It's family time. Like if you ever wanted to have a vacation, use the time with your family. Do the, all the things that you've always wanted to do. And I'm doing that right now. I'm playing video games with my little sister. I'm talking more to my parents. Uh, we're playing cards. It's family time. So uh, I think you can also learn more new things when you cannot go out. Like I'm currently taking online courses that I've never taken before because I was too busy. And uh, I have you know, so much time that I can actually start reading or learning how to cook. So there's always a way to, to take advantage of the situation, no matter how bad it is. And uh, to, to use it to your advantage, to learn more, to become a better person, you develop, develop your skills and your personality. And um, again, you spend time with family, which is, I guess, the most important thing in the world, as the American people would say. Thank you. Um, I think to a little bit. I think one of the very special things about our type of resilience um, is humor. And I can tell you every day there seems to be at least 10 new Corona jokes. I'm not sure <laughs> you know, how people are coming up with them, but we're seeing video after video, we're seeing joke after joke, all about Corona, all about the situation. Um, but also at home being able to keep oneself busy and I think you specified about children. And I think it's important that for the children, of course, keeping them busy, but this is also an excellent opportunity for parents to engage with their children with the material that they are learning. Because as we all, all know or always say, school isn't simply outside of the home. The home is also a school in itself. And so within that being able to take that education and putting ourselves in the role of the teacher and furthering the education. The other part of this is, of course, doing all the chores that we have at home that we put on and we leave there until we're under quarantine or until we're in a situation like this. I know with, my, I know with my family, I'm very fortunate. My whole life, I've been surrounded by very strong women. And I currently have my sister here. And every day, she's made us go out and plant a tree around the house. We've now planted over 40 trees. Wow. It's a bit exhausting, but also <laughs> learning new things. For the first time, some of my uncles are getting to that age of 60 and 70. For the first time in their lives, they know how to make grape leaves. They're okay. helping their wives and helping in the kitchens and learning how to cook. Um, and so this is the time to explore avenues that we haven't had the time to explore because life was always there and always got in the way. And it's also a time to continue connecting with our friends and family, to call that neighbor that you haven't spoken to for a hundred years and ask them how they're doing, or ask for a recipe that you forgot. <laughs> so, but the important thing is to not be boggled down by the news too much, not to fear too much, but also be able to enjoy this time and even use it for a time of reflection, being able to sit with oneself, turn off the world for a minute, and just see, see that future that we hope to wake up to, and then begin to plan it. We have been trying to educate ourselves and others in gender sensitivity and gender justice. Thanks for the corona to give us the golden opportunity to be gender sensitive and gender just. I, I think, um, you know, as a family, we have been under the attack of occupation, corona, and the separation of my wife. As you know, the Israelis are not allowing my wife to be here, so we are divided, half of us here and half of us in the northern sphere. So we, through perseverance, through resilience, we continue to live together uh, despite of this separation. And, uh, yes. and it's we're facing the same thing too. My mom is in the in the states, and she can't make it here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, in addition to planting trees, I think even we might not have a big space for each one of us uh, in Palestine, but we could have victory gardens to have 
small uh, places for uh, mint, for sage, for lettuce, for parsley. This will uh, make us closer to our land. And of course, Tariq was humble and Marcel are teachers and they spend almost three hours every day trying not to teach you know, the systematic issues, but other issues that engage their students in discussion and to be creative, to be open-minded. And of course, uh, we try to reach out uh, others for counseling and guidance. And uh, probably I would uh, use not only jokes, but also proverbs. And you talked, uh, Rula, about the uh, weather. So we will have this motto as our uh, example for life. We say, whether the weather be fine or whether the weather be not, we will weather the weather, whatever the weather, whether we like it or not. Therefore, wow. we continue to weather the weather, whether the Israeli occupation, whether Corona, or whether the all injustices against us. Oh, wow. wow, thank you. I think, I think this really was, uh, all, all, all of you and Dr. Renz who did have to leave, um, leave us to join another meeting, just really embodied you know, the, the spirit and the soul of, of Palestine and the steadfastness um, and, and just remind us of, of what we need to do and what we can do and how to ha what kind of perspective to have in this moment um, and really what to use this time for. Um, and, and I mean, even, even from previous, the previous questions to take this time to stand in solidarity, to, to do this kind of work to, to keep and to keep Palestine um, uh, in our hearts and minds. Um, I think that that's, it's, it's the perfect uh, really ending to this conversation because everything you've, you've inspired us in everything that you've said. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, will I do you have anybody, anybody happy Easter, uh, Christina and Selmin for no matter which uh, upcoming holidays you have, wishing you all the best and we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.